Welcome to the final stage of Unbox 2022. I'm Adam Stachowiak. I'm the founder and the editor-in-chief of Changelog Media. We produce awesome podcasts for developers. And uh, I'm here with Jack Dorsey. Jack, this is your conference. You need no introduction, of course. But uh, if you were, who are you? I mean, you're the CEO and founder of Block. You've done some cool stuff. Uh, thank you for your time. It's been awesome. Thank I'm you. for to talk to you. Appreciate you. Uh, you know, before we go into all the details of the announcements of this conference and obviously the name change from Square to Block and this bigger vision that you're, that you're uh, implementing and doing, can we talk a bit about you? The reason why I think I want to do this is because this is a developer conference. You're, uh, in your own words, you've said you're a hacker. You're a hacker trend CEO. I, I watched the Lex Friedman podcast you're on, and you know, I, I love that, uh, that podcast and your appearance on there. But um, what does it mean to be a hacker turned CEO today? Yeah, when, when I was uh, 14, like I was a legitimate hacker. Like I, I just loved tinkering with computers and I found BBSs and I found the internet through those BBSs. And it was the only way I, I really learned in the early days was um, trying to find ways into these systems. Um, and then seeing the source code for a lot of it because a lot of the source code of the early internet was open, still is. Um, yeah. Most of the internet runs on open source software. So I have so much gratitude for the people that chose usually as their side things to build software for the public and in the public. Um, and it, it was, I was really into punk rock at the time as well. Um, and one of the interesting things around punk rock is like, you know, someone gets up there first time with a band and they're absolutely terrible. And then you see them the next month and they get a little bit better and you see them two months after that and they're really good. And then they get great. And um, just being able to like create in public and make your mistakes in public. I saw the same sort of attitude and approach in um, on the internet and in open source software where you're not, you're a terrible programmer and you put something out there and, and you get feedback and it's usually super negative feedback and, you know, um, angry people behind keyboards, but it gets you into a better state. It, it helps you learn. Um, and you learn from others just by watching their work and watching what they're doing and, and what mistakes they're making. The, the other thing of hacker to me means like you do whatever it takes to make it work. I, yeah. I was not an engineer. I would never an engineer. Um, I just don't have the skill for that. An engineer being someone who actually can make something work, but also it be stable and scalable and, um, and be fail safe. Um, I learned enough to make the thing work barely work and it would probably fall down at some point. Um, so I wrote the, all the original code for Square uh, back then and it was quickly replaced by people who could actually make it scale. Yeah. Although I thought mine was pretty good <laughs> in this case. <laughs> yeah, you're doing some cool stuff in the public too, especially with Spar. We'll talk about some of the stuff that you're doing in the open, you know, the, the Bitcoin wallet, of course, mining Bitcoin, the hardware aspects, but this aspect of embracing open source software, embracing you know, really the public aspect of getting that feedback loop, which I think is pretty interesting. So feel free to pepper that in as we get closer to it. But I know that you mine Bitcoin. Do you do anything, anything developer today? Like if you're hacking today, how would you describe a hack that you might do? Not so much today specifically, but today in terms of the time frame. Yeah, I mean, just on that point, like I, I think it's really important as companies get more successful that they give back to what they've taken so much from. And open source was that for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're doing a lot with open source because, we, because we've because we been successful because of it and we need to give back. Um, mm -hmm. so today I'm learning how to program Rust. Um, and that's ah, yes. literally today, but also over the past few months. <laughs> and I love the language. I think it's incredible. It um, Its compiler is amazing because it points out so many errors that you would have not otherwise seen until you run it. Mm -hmm. Some weird occurrence happens and then you come into contact with it. So it's it's an amazingly well-designed language and I and like, it's a joy to write stuff in it. Pro Rust. All right. What kind of things you hacking on with Rust? Anything in particular? Just basic stuff. I, I, I really love like low latency real-time systems. So I'm trying to get more into that, but obviously like there's a lot of um, Bitcoin in the broader crypto ecosystem that's written mm -hmm. in Rust. So um, it's, it's very good at 
real-time low latency system level work. And that's kind of what I'm fascinated by. Not that it would be useful at all, but um, it's, a, it's a great challenge for me. I think it's so important to tinker, right? You got to remain curious. 100%. And if you get stagnant, if you don't, I mean, it, it would be semi easy for someone like you to be where you're at in terms of your, you know, what you've achieved in your life and what you lead to just sort of just lean back a little bit. But I think being curious is always important to kind of progress and grow and, and just still innovate. Really, you see the edge of things and, and you're not, you're not letting go. Yep. hundred percent. That's yeah. why I do it. Well, the theme of this conference uh, is this new world. And it could be sort of framed in a couple of ways. Obviously, this new world in terms of what happened in the last couple of years, but also this new world in terms of this name change, Square Term Block, uh, Square being the synonymous name for your seller's platform and everything you're doing there. But what is uh, this was announced back in December, the, the name of Block, et cetera. The site is obviously super beautiful. I love the site. When it first came out, I was like, what is this Block.xyz? And it was really cool. Uh, TBD, spiral, title, you know, cash app. You've got a lot of things happening, but share the bigger picture of what happened with the behind the scenes of this name change. Sure, people see in December this new name, these new de- these new desires for for Square now as Block. But help me understand when this journey began and why Block exists today. What you plan to do? Yeah, it it really began like at the start of the company. We we made a conscious choice not to name our company after anything having to do with payments or finance. So we wanted a word, a name that allowed us flexibility and didn't keep us into the payments world. We didn't really know why. We had no plans or intentions about expanding beyond what we originally started with, which was just a credit card reader that plugged into the phone. Yeah. But little by little, as we saw people use it, we realized we weren't building a credit card reader. We were building a way for people to make a sale. And then we stepped back and said, well, credit card reader is one way to make a sale, but it's not the only one. There's many ways for someone to make a sale. So that led us to like build a register to help people organize, you know, their information around their business and make better decisions, which would grow their sales and make more sales. It allowed us to get to Square Capital, which allowed us to lend people money to build up their business. Five thousand dollars for a few new salon chairs could double or triple your your business um, just with that small loan, which no bank was doing under twenty five thousand dollars. And it allowed us to build something like Cash App. Um, that was more focused on individuals instead of sellers. And that, that was a moment, especially as Cash App got bigger and bigger in, in terms of scale, that we realized that, oh, there might be something here. We're not just building an ecosystem for sellers, but we're building an ecosystem of ecosystems. And, and what I mean by that is like the seller business has always been about what are all the tools that we can build for a seller to help them make the sale and make more sales? And how do they positively reinforce one another? Utilizing the register, using the register uh, and payments allows you access to get a square capital loan, for for instance. Um, Using the developer platform, um, you know, allows you to build other functionality on top of, or get functionality for a a small business or a larger size business. So we were really excited about that idea of like building this ecosystem and now we had two ecosystems at scale. And so, you know, we asked like, why not add others? And we found another one called Tidal, which is a music streaming service, which felt like a, to a lot of people, it felt like a very weird thing to do, a financial company buying a music streaming service. But if you look at what an artist has to go through to start their career or grow their career, it's not all that dissimilar from a small business. So we we're focused on the artist problem, not the, the streaming aspect. And yeah. And then we started um, a, a new business in a new ecosystem called TBD, which intends to build a developer platform for um, people to build exchanges, uh, Bitcoin exchanges all around the world. So when we got to those four, we're like, um, you know, Square doesn't, Square, sellers know Square as Square. They don't consider Cash App to be part of that. Cash App doesn't consider Square at all. In fact, most of the Cash App customers don't even know that Square exists. Um, so we needed we needed a new name. We needed to give the Square name to Square, to the seller business. And, uh, and therefore we needed a new name. And we went through a lot um, of names, some terrible, some amazing. And we ended up at Block because there's 
a reference to the square shape. Um, it's just as boring as a name square. We wanted a boring name originally because we didn't want to be in front of our customers. We yeah. wanted to be invisible. We wanted to be behind them. We wanted to be under them. Um, it's a reference to a block, uh, like a neighborhood block, where we found our sellers, a block party for title, blockchain for all the Bitcoin stuff we're doing. So the, the name just worked. Um, and, um, you know, it's simple and boring and we can, we can work to make it cool, but it's never meant to be a consumer facing brand. It, it's only mm -hmm. for our recruiting efforts, our investors, um, and, uh, and, and like a way to reference this thing that contains all these, all these companies inside of it. Yeah. One of the things you said in um, in the announcement for, I think, is really interesting. Uh, you said Block is a new name, but our purpose of economic empowerment remains the same. You said no matter how we grow or change, we will continue. And this is the point I want to kick on is we will continue to build tools to help increase access to the economy. And that's obviously where you begin with Square with sellers and this realization going from the original hardware to the platform and all the software and all the data science behind things. I think that's really interesting how that vision process, because as you had said, all the things you're doing grew beyond the Square brand. And it actually kind of hindered Square because it's like, I was a Cash App user, I've been a Cash App user since 2013. And I talked to other Cash App users. I pay florists, I pay my masseuse. I mean, I pay a lot of different people. I pay my uh, housekeeper, I pay my babysitter all through Cash App, but they don't know that it's Square. And yeah. it's interesting how this name change to allow you to, you know, zoom out further, but still kind of anchor into that core point of increasing access to the economy. Can you yeah. speak to that? Yeah. I, um, so our, our purpose is economic empowerment, which as you said, is a way of saying, you know, how do we build tools to allow people to participate in the economy more or better? Mm -hmm. uh, in the, in the early days of Square, it was just like, I need to accept credit cards and my bank is not allowing me to. They, they, you know, they, they didn't have the infrastructure to do that or, or they chose not to. So, you know, we enabled, you know, millions of businesses who otherwise couldn't get a credit card acceptance account to get one. Um, and that was purely access. The, the same thing was true for Cash App, which is like access to fast, speedy, simple financial rails to send money peer to peer. But then we started holding balances for people so they could effectively get a savings account with Cash App or a checking account. We issued Visa credit cards uh, for them that works at ATM so they can get extra paper cash, allow them to buy and sell Bitcoin. All these things um, go towards that, that purpose. And, and that's what we decided. You know, we have these like four business units now and each one of them effectively has a CEO and each one of them can do whatever they want in terms of the culture, the values, the operating principles. But the one thing they must align around is our purpose. Are they serving more access to the economy? Are they serving more economic um, empowerment? And that's why title made sense for us is because if we get this right, then we're empowering economically artists, which has been the biggest issue for artists and musicians specifically. The label takes so much from them. They're not making a lot of money from a, uh, a stream. They're making money from merchandise, Merch, yeah. and touring and... Um, they don't have a lot of options to make that part easy. Like that part is hard. And that's the part that we made easy with, with Square, like our e-commerce sites and in-person and services like, like touring and ticketing and whatnot. So to give them all of that infrastructure for any artist, whether they be very small or, or, or very large, uh, and to put it into one download and to have yeah. an API associated with it to, to this conference, um, to put in this conference, is I think pretty pretty incredible. I agree. I want to speak to the the evolution, I suppose, of Square. Let's zoom into Square itself, since we've got Square as the primary, you know, the primary brand that was there before this rename, and obviously the all these changes you described. But there was an evolution that took place. You began with, as you said before, this hacker mentality. Some of the all the early code for Square was written by you, and obviously replaced over time because you know, better people, you hire better people, right? Smarter people than you. Um, but there's this evolution that took place. You started with this hardware device and you had this idea to sort of just accept payments, but then something else happened. Something else happened that it wasn't just simply about, oh, help this 
seller accept credit cards, then it was helping them get access to it. But now it's a platform and it's a full-fledged platform with open source APIs and tons and tons of developers and tons of partners being a part of this. Uh, so far was talked about lots of different things happen around this implementation of this platform for folks. But help me understand what Square is today and how it's evolved from this initial idea of a hardware device that you hack together for an iOS device or the 3.5 inch jack or the 3.5 jack. We resisted building an API and a platform for a long time, mainly due to my experience with Twitter. Like that, that with that service, we really released the API day one. And there was a lot of benefit to it, but all of our downtime was because of that API. Like people were just doing, you know, unexpected, crazy things as you would expect them to do. Yes. Really open API. And we should have had more constraints and controls over that. Um, but we just didn't know what we didn't know. And with Square, I knew more of that. And now we're moving money around. So people doing crazy, unexpected things could come at a, a different cost. Um, so we, we wanted to be very thoughtful about how we thought about a platform and, and how um, we built it out. And it wasn't until we hired Alyssa, who runs um, Square in our, our seller business, that we felt comfortable like really going for it. Um, and the reason why is because we had experience building that at Microsoft and Amazon, and I'm sure made a bunch of mistakes there. And all those mistakes will not be repeated. We can make new mistakes now. So um, we we you know took that experience, and then uh, she she did something really cool, was which was like. Everything that we use, um, everything that we build that's front facing to our customers should use the exact same API that we're giving to external developers as well. So the register uses the same API and platform that um, any third party developer can. It really simplified how we thought about building generally and um, made us slower for a little bit, but then, you know, the, the, the gains compound and make us much faster, but it put us on the level playing field with our developers as well, which I, which I think is really important. Yeah. Not a lot of companies tend to do that. Um, so that, that was a, a critical insight. And, and I think that was, you know, one of the reasons our, our platform has been as successful as it has uh, is because like this principle of like, we're going to use, what we're giving out to other people as well. And like, and if we feel the pain, they're going to feel the pain and they can't feel pain. So wow. let's make sure that, that we're building in such a way that, that we don't feel the pain either. Yeah. It, it really changed our company and, uh, and gave us an opportunity for our customers to build on top of us, to build alongside of us, and then also create a developer ecosystem that's doing it for businesses, um, small businesses, larger businesses, but allows us to, you know, fit into whatever, arcane system that exists or anything that people want to build that, you know, we'll, we will never build because it's too specific mm -hmm. to, to niche, but really meaningful to that particular person or, or that organization. Can you speak, I mean, I, I'm obviously a, a developer myself. I got a heart for developers. My company is totally focused on media that is for software developers. So our audience, when you say, who's your audience, it's software developers. So given that, and we're at this conference, Square Unboxed 2022, it's for developers. You've got sellers here too, I'm sure. You've got partners here. You've got a, the larger ecosystem, but it's focused on software developers. And this is where I was like really captured by this vision of Square because you know, I think there's some folks who may have a misconception or a, uh, an incorrect <laughs> assumption of what Square is, but this platform for developers to build upon. Help me, help me understand what the opportunity is for developers. Because I've been speaking to folks behind the scenes, Shannon Skipper and others about this. And it's like, well, this is a place for developers to come and build apps for millions of sellers globally. And as you roll to Japan and other markets, the opportunity only gets greater. And as Bitcoin maybe becomes, you know, an internet native currency, Cash App, and as it gets integrated with Cash App Pay, et cetera, that's happening now, this is an interesting space to be in? Help me understand the opportunity specifically for developers. We learned, I mean, we learned a lot from um, the seller platform uh, such that, you know, Cash App is going to do something similar and TBD is an entirely, you know, it's entirely a platform. Like that's its only reason to be in and to exist. 
So, you know, we're, we're definitely on that track and we want to make sure that we're building more and more um, platform type things forevermore. Like everything that we do in the future should have platform elements. Even um, we're building a Bitcoin wallet and a Bitcoin miner. Yeah. And we're building it so that it's open source. All the code will be available. The hardware design will be available. Everything about it will be completely open for any developer to use. They don't need to build on top of it. They can just steal all the code and the ID and just build whatever they want. Um, and Learn from your mistakes or get yeah, bytes. That, that's, yeah, that's by design. That's by design. Again, giving back to the community. We'll, we'll compete on our build quality. We'll compete on our experience. We'll compete on services like security. That's, you know, we want to define that lane and then and then stick to it. But everything else should be usable by by everyone. And and that's that I think is the opportunity is um, we want to open as much as possible. And again, like we don't know what we don't know. And like the more open you are um, and the less constraint you have on what can be built, the more surprising and un unexpectedly great things can happen. And that benefits the whole ecosystem. It, it goes back like... In the seller case, certainly everything built by developers on the platform benefits sellers and benefits Square and, and Block. In the in the Bitcoin wallet and the Bitcoin miner space, um, if someone just takes the designs and takes the code and builds their own thing, it benefits the Bitcoin ecosystem. Doesn't benefit Block directly, but over time, because the Bitcoin ecosystem is stronger and better, then Block is stronger and better. So that that's just the mindset, and uh, you know, I. This uh, this platform um, that we're discussing today started all. Okay. So in terms of some key API announcements, you got a lot of fun stuff happening this call this conference today. Uh, you you've got Cash App Pay, which is GA for developers. I believe it's in the U.S. only. Uh, you got Afterpay, which is in GA for developers. That's U.S. and Australia because it's originated in Australia. It makes sense. You got your Bookings API. You got your Checkout API. Of these particular APIs, obviously they extend the platform, they enable more to happen. Is there any one in particular that like you're just personally excited about or played a hand in, or there's any excitement around there for you? Uh, um, this is going to sound like a non-answer, so I apologize, apologize for that. But uh, the, the reason I think we're successful as a company is because we're not focused on any one thing. Like it's the in-between that matters. It's a connection between all these things that matter, right? And the, the breadth of our offering that matters. Like we com we compete with like you know registers and payment providers and lenders, but the fact that we have it all in one app um, is what sets us apart and makes us unique. It makes us a little bit slower because we have to manage all the complexity instead of a seller hooking all these things together and having that complexity. So we've taken that complexity on. But it makes us a lot more deliberate, and I think it makes us a lot more resilient. Yeah. So we approach the platform in the same way. Like, if you use any one of these parts, they can be exciting. But the, if you if they positively reinforce one another, then it's real. So what I'm most excited about is we continue to build out things that have the potential to positively reinforce another aspect of the platform or the API or um, the the broader the broader ecosystem, and you know. Afterpay is a good example of that. Like this is exactly in between Square and Cash App. Like yeah. Exactly in between. And it's like the best um, way for us to show like we intend to connect these ecosystems together. That's the power. Like there are competitors that have all the seller tools we have potentially. They don't have Cash App. They don't have any, you know, consumer, consumer focus. And the competitors that have a Cash App type thing, they don't have any of the seller side. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we get into the music and nobody has that. So like, it's that, that's the exciting bit for me. It's just like how these things work together rather than the, the individual parts. I love that you're able to give these companies and their CEOs really that room to do what they need to do, provided that one adherence that you mentioned. Uh, but the platform that you're building enables them all to be connected. As you'd mentioned, Afterpay sort of sits in between Square and Cash App, and in many ways, kind of caters to that Cash App consumer who maybe is less excited about using a credit card and more excited about using their own cash or Bitcoin or the credit card you give. Or I guess it's not really a credit card; it's more of a it uses the credit card system, but it's not a credit card itself. It's that just simply mm -hmm. a cash card. 
that enables all those things to connect. That's that's really, I think, you know, when I asked you the question earlier about developers, I think that's what's beautiful because if you choose this platform and we're going to get into so fine what's happening there, this is a larger implementation for a seller. What happens for developers is now they got like this, all these interconnected abilities really between Cash App, Afterpay, Square the Platform, Title, TBD, Spiral, all these fun things you're doing. Like it's, it's really astounding. I mean, I got to ask you more questions. I'm not even sure where to go because we just have so, there's just so much we could cover. <laughs> given that, I mean, given that, what, in terms of, in terms of Cash App, in terms of Afterpay, like why did that acquisition make sense for you? Like how did that, how did that click for you? Cause it was, when that acquisition came out, a lot of folks were like, why? That's interesting, but why? Help, yeah. help us understand the why to that. Did, I mean, the other thing I'm really proud of is like, this is not a strategy that came from me. It came from Alyssa, who runs Square, the seller business, and Brian, who runs Cash Up, and they worked together because you know I had been pushing them for for you know for some time to like push the ecosystems together and like find the connections between the two because we know they're there. They they might start off as very small, mm-hmm. uh, but it came out of that push where they found an obvious connection that was large, and and that was that was Afterpay. And we met with um, the entrepreneurs and the leads there, Nick and Ant, and uh, you know, just loved their their values and what they're trying to do in the world, and um, how much humility uh, they have, and like um, what what they care about. And it just felt like a fit, like it felt like one thing. So we made it one thing, even though it's a very very large thing to do, the biggest thing we've ever done, and extremely risky. But I I trusted Brian and um, Brian and Alyssa, because they did they did the work and and they showed why this connection makes sense and why it's a future and um, why it's really important for each one of their businesses, but more importantly for our business block. Um, and you know, the majority of my time right now is focused on the smaller things like title and the Bitcoin stuff and um, and small uh, for now. Yeah, small for now, uh, TPD, <laughs> but. Um, and I had that same relationship with, uh, with Square and Cash App where before I was in every product review, now I have no idea what they're doing. And um, I, I hear about it usually when the world hears about it and it's awesome. Like I just, I love it. I think it's really interesting because my experience with Square as a, I guess, as the person who swipes the card or pays a merchant has generally been florists, barbers, my masseuse. You know, those types of folks were sure they're smaller. They have your point of sale. They have all that, all the hardware there on that front. But SoFi Stadium is a different kind of seller for you to approach. You were invited to the RFP as a dark horse candidate, which I think is super interesting, essentially saying you're not going to win and you do win. And, you know, SoFi Stadium is a massive stadium. It's all high tech from the engineering of the architecture itself up to integrating square but this rfp you got invited to it as a dark horse candidate can you speak to just what that means to attract the invitation of and win that kind of seller from the dawn of the company like maybe a year or two years in we were wanting to be in stadiums but we didn't have an api back then um and it would have been and this is what we did for a few things a lot of custom work that um, we had to build and take away from, it took away from everything else that we were doing. And um, it was the, it was the API and the platform that really uh, enabled us to even consider um, being in that RFP process. Um, I I think I could be wrong that um, Warriors Stadium in in San Francisco came slightly earlier than uh, SoFi, but the Chase Center, but in, in both cases, like the, I think one of the key winning differentiators was was a platform. Like this is a huge, um, massively scaled operation. Like hardware is failing all the time. Networks are going down. Um, backend software and legacy software is failing all the time and has massive amounts of redundancy. So these are the things that we could not build alone for, for any customer, any client. Um, it had to be a function of like how good and flexible the platform was. And it really comes down to that word flexibility. I think we are the most, most flexible, and I think that's why we won. And I think it's all due to you know what we've done with the platform. So obviously, we left out Spiral from the deeper conversation. We touched on the open source nature of it, the 
Bitcoin wallet, the hardware to mine, all that stuff. But it began, it began as Square Crypto. And I obviously I did some, I did some research uh, in terms of when it began for for this. And you had said, uh, what's the biggest thing we could do for Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community, and and one of your co partners, Mike had said, hire five uh, five open source developers and just let them do fun stuff. Can you talk about the inception of Square Crypto and how that's evolved into Spiral and what you're doing there? Yeah, I and mean, that's exactly uh, what it was. I, uh, Mike and I were having dinner. He runs TBD now, by the way, Mike Brock. And uh, he was the one I, we, Bitcoin and Cash App started as a Hack Week project with me and Mike. So we were both, uh, we were both building it. So he's kind of been my partner all along the way on, on the Bitcoin side of things. And um, I asked him, like, what's, the, you know, what's the greatest thing we can do for the community to give back? Because like, we just, I just kept feeling like we, we're not giving back enough. Yeah. He, he said, just hire five Bitcoin engineers and let them do whatever they want. Um, don't give them square equity. Give them Bitcoin. Um, give them no direction whatsoever and, uh, and see what happens. And we, I texted Amrita, our CFO, and said, uh let's spare you know five million dollars a, a year for this thing that we just decided we just decided to do and she's like okay and uh we kicked off a hiring process to find a lead and uh that person was steve lee and we didn't um we didn't even want to say like um you know all of you need to work on one project or you can all work on different projects we wanted that to be up to them so Steve hired four other people and uh, assembled a team. And then they all went to an offsite to kick things off. And they decided that they wanted to work together on one project. And they wanted to work on a lightning uh, development kit um, to make lightning easy for wallet developers. And they wanted to do it in Rust. And um, and they built it in two years. And, and again, they, they told me all this. I'm like, great, amazing. Um, and, you know, we introduced them to the broader company and great, amazing. Um, we didn't expect anything from it. And then two years later, as Cash App is launching its Lightning uh, feature, it's using LDK. It's using what yeah. they do. So that, I mean, if you're ever into a state where like you can fund open source developers, not just around Bitcoin, but anything, you, you might get something back that's extremely valuable to your company. I mean, it would have taken cash up so much longer if LDK did not exist. And again, like they weren't, they weren't building that for Square's interest. They were building it for like wallet developers that were not cash up because cash up had no interest in that time of using Lightning. Um, and uh, I, I just think that's, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Like it just happened um, and we didn't force it to happen. It just happened. I mean, I think you're an innovator and I think that what you've done so far and what you've enabled with the teams you've hired and you've given mm -hmm. just flexibility to do fun things, do whatever you want, and something actually comes out of it is pretty admirable and quite an accomplishment. So I'm, I'm really excited about what happens yeah. in this space. Uh, I saw a tweet from you to Cardi B. She said something like, you know, is, is Bitcoin going to take over the dollar? You said, yes, it will. Is Bitcoin going to replace the U.S. dollar? Is that something you expect? I don't think there would there ever be a replacement for any of these things, but I do think there will be one that is more dominant. And I think, um, I think there's a potential for the, the, I think there's a very strong potential that the U S dollar loses its um, global singular reserve currency status. And there may be a second one in the, the Chinese one. And um, there might be a third one in Bitcoin. Um, and I think that's a net positive. I'm obviously rooting for Bitcoin because of the properties behind it, because it's transparent, because no company or individual controls it, because no government controls it, because um, it's resilient, it's secure, it's never been hacked, um, you know, it's never gone down. Um, that's what I want out of my money, but I want the transparency. I want it, I want it to be owned by the people as well. So having a world reserve currency that is owned by the people and developed in the way that Bitcoin is developed, I think is very, very powerful. And I think is, would be ideal for everyone on the planet, um, not to be controlled by the dominance of any one government's 
uh, currency. But I, I do think that we're, we're moving away from a time when there's one and there will probably be many and then maybe one will become dominant. Well, Jet, that's a good place to end things on. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your insights shared today. Really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to Square Unboxed. This is an awesome conference. And back to you, Shantae.